Well, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. So good to see everyone. I don't recognize some of you because you're not sitting in your normal seats. <laughs> I mean, people were such creatures of habit, aren't we? But uh, so excited you could come and join us for a candlelight service. Why don't we begin by standing? And uh, I'm going to pray. So you know, if you haven't been here before, who, who's been here for a candlelight service in years past? <laughs> Woo, yeah, that's right. Excited. Uh, glad you could be here. This is one of my favorite nights of the year, what we do here at Grace. And we're really uh, bringing back the old traditional songs, you know, not Frosty the Snowman. We're, we're, we're singing about Jesus tonight. And it's really a sing-along. Uh, this isn't going to be a performance. It's not how great our band is, but they're great. It's about our church singing together the songs that declare what God has done through Christ for you and me. So we can really celebrate what Christmas is all about and really enjoy this night together. So we're going to pray and ask God's blessing on it all. So why don't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to refocus our uh, Christmas season and our Christmas uh, approach to things. That, Lord, it would really be about Christ. As great as gifts and showing tangible love to one another is, Lord, we thank you more importantly for the spiritual realities of the gift of Christ that you have given to each one of us. We thank you, Lord, that you changed all of human history when you sent Jesus, your own son, to come save us. So we get to celebrate all that tonight. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence. We thank you, God, that you are with us. And we praise and thank you for tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we're going to stand and sing this first song together, and then we're going to sit down. gospel narrative through the gospel of Luke about the birth of Christ. And then we're going to stop periodically where some of the traditional Christmas hymns occur and how they coincide with the narrative. So listen carefully to Luke chapter one, verse two. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria and all went to be registered each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child.
time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Oh 
verse 8. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased.
When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Let's stand for this last one. Let's sing it out loud.
right, you can be seated. Before we do the candle lighting part of our service, I just want to share with you a few, few moments to kind of bring the whole story of Christmas to bear on our souls a little bit. But if you were expecting a Christmas edition dad joke <laughs> monologue, um, you're not going to get it tonight. I know. Some of you are like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Others of you, I have convinced you that dad jokes are awesome and you agree with me. Yes. Though you may be a small population in our church, um, you have to wait till Christmas Eve morning, Sunday morning, to get those dad jokes. <laughs> Working hard on them already, right? But for tonight, I want to talk a little bit about the stories we tell. Uh, stories have immense power to actually communicate many things to us, and we're drawn to stories if we're honest. Human life, human values, human experiences are taught, celebrated, and shared in the stories we tell one another. Maybe you have family members or friends who are great storytellers. You get around a campfire, and here come the stories. You sit down at dinner together. Now, in our family, some of my favorite moments is when we don't plan it. We're sitting down at a normal family dinner, and Jen and I start just telling stories about what has happened in our life or what we've gone through or what God has done, and we're sharing it with our five kids, and, and then they start sharing things, and then they start telling us things that they did when they were younger that we didn't know, <laughs> right? They, they, and we're like, really? Like, where were we? Oh, well, you walked upstairs, and then they start telling us all these funny things that happened when we weren't paying attention. Uh, but we like these stories. We like to tell what's going on. And really, we as human beings are hardwired by God, our creator, to love a good story. And there's no greater storyteller than God himself. But whether it's fiction or nonfiction, real or make-believe, either way, we find ourselves being drawn into the characters that are a part of these stories. We can identify with their experiences. We can, we can go through the trials and victories that they may face. Now, unfortunately, in our day and age, in our culture, the storytellers are not the old and the wise like they used to be. They still can be. But nowadays, the primary storytellers in our culture are the filmmakers and the production studios, the script writers and the actors. Now, whether you use a streaming service like Netflix, Hulu, or Disney+, Plus, those services, if you look at their catalog of movies, are full of all kinds of stories, storylines, and plots. And many of you have gone through these stories with your friends and family. Some of them you hold near and dear. Now, I like stories of all kinds. There's not a specific movie genre I like the best. I, I like the uh, action-adventure movies. I like the post-apocalyptic, end-of-the-world sci-fi scenarios. I like the fantastical, otherworldly flicks that aren't real in any way. And I'll even admit to a romantic movie or even a rom-com. <laughs> I am man enough to admit I will watch those and enjoy them. A walk to remember anybody? Oh, I got a clap on that one. None of you guys clapped. But your wife could out you right now. And say, I saw, yeah, remember that one, honey? And you're like, be quiet. Okay. We do like those. They, they touch a part of our heart. Now, here's an activity I've planned for all of us tonight. Let's see how good you are at naming the title of these movies based on their plot. The first one's a beginner level, okay? A teenage boy gets bit by a radioactive spider. <laughs> Spider-Man. Here's the problem with that title. He's a boy. It's spider boy. Have you ever thought about that? It's not Spider-Man. He's a teenager. He is not a man. Wrong title. All right, here's this one. Don't ruin it. Shout it out when I first start this one. Last service, they did that. Just bear with me. A band of adventurous teens tried to save their family houses from foreclosure. And in the process, they find a map in the attic that leaves them on a journey to find a treasure from One-Eyed Willie. Goonies. Goonies, right? The goondocks, all right? What about this one? Any movie with a lightsaber. <laughs> right, it's kind of easy. Who said Star Trek? <laughs> now, let's admit, some of you don't know the difference between Star Wars and Star Trek. 
Anybody willing to admit that in public? Mm, I see you. All right. There's a problem with you guys. All right. Here's one, the holiday edition of this. This beloved holiday movie follows the wintry exploits of youngster Ralphie Parker, who spends most of the time dodging a bully and dreaming of his ideal Christmas gift, a Red Ryder BB gun. <laughs> Christmas story. You'll shoot your eye out, kid, right? You guys are pretty good. All right, how about this one? I'll just give you the name. Kevin McAllister. <laughs> Home alone, right? His family leaves on vacation. He gets left home alone and has to defend himself and the home from burglars. All right. How about this one? An infant accidentally stows away in Santa's sack. Ends up, yeah, ends up in the North Pole. And Buddy the Elf goes on a journey to find his dad. Buddy, I hope you find your dad. Right? <laughs> the narwhal. You remember that part? All right. Next one. Here we go. Getting into some of the more romantic movies. An elderly man reads to a woman with dementia the story of two young lovers. It's, aww, a love story that spans over five decades. Their love endures an uncertain beginning, the onset and conclusion of World War II, the death of one child, and an eventual diagnosis of, uh, diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. That, the notebook. That's the one no man wants to admit to liking. <laughs> right? The notebook. See, if I would have said... This elderly guy reads from a notebook. You would have known it right away, right? Okay, here's another one. The true story of Louis Zamperini. Young boy, troubled, finds the love of running through his older brother, ends up competing in the 1936 Olympics. World War II breaks out. He enlists in the military, and his plane crashes in the Pacific. He spends 47 days adrift at sea, only to be captured by the Japanese Navy and sent to a POW camp. Unbroken. Unbroken. Now, here's the thing about that movie, as opposed to the other ones. Unbroken is the true story, right? It, it's not something somebody made up. Somebody really lived through these experiences, and out of all the storylines that are out there, the ones that impact me the most, and probably you, are the ones that are true stories or based on a true story, right? How many times have you Googled a movie and said, is this movie based on a true story? And you found out it's not. And what's your, what's your response? Uh, right? Because you want it to be true. Because when it's true, it has more value and impact because it's not just some fantastical story of these incredible exploits that somebody made up. It's, wow, that person's life really went through all of those experiences, the good and the bad. Like Braveheart, Google it. Not a true story. <gasps> yeah, all you guys out there who love Braveheart, not true. Nope, none of it. William Wallace did not lead the Scottish people to freedom. It was Robert the Bruce. Yeah, the whole character, everything's wrong about it. But it's still a fun movie. But it's fake. It's not true. It would have been more impactful if it was real. See, real stories with real people, real historical events impact us the most. They're full of meaning and purpose. And you get to experience their trials and their triumphs. You get to feel their heartbreak and be filled with their hopes. And you may not realize this, but there is no greater true story in all the world than the story of Jesus. That's why our theme tonight is true story because what happened at Christmas is not some fictitious story that somebody made up that's fantastical that has all these great elements to it and then you Google it, is it a true story? And it's like, nope, fiction. No, this is nonfiction. This is the real story of Jesus and every amazing story has what they call a narrative arc. And it's four elements. And God is the greatest storyteller of all time. And the true story of his son is going to be the best story ever told. Because it's real. Now here's the four elements. The setup, the rising tension, the climax, and the resolution. So let's look at the life of Jesus in these four terms. The setting. It goes all the way back to creation. We know that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he made everything good. And on day six, he made mankind. Man and woman in his image. To rule over creation. To be in communion with him. To be with him. And to enjoy him and glorify him in the life that he's given them. Everything was created good. That is the setting where human history begins. 
And then here comes the rising tension, the next part of the narrative arc, is that humanity created good, then ends up becoming bad through whose choices? Their own. They were deceived by the devil. They broke God's one commandment. And because of this, the tension increases exponentially. Because now, God and man who were in union together, a holy God and a good holy people, they are no longer holy. They are wicked. They are sinners because they've rebelled against God. And now all the problems of human history originated in that one decision. Now you have sickness, now you have disease, now you have death itself ruling over human experience. But here's where the first of the plot twists comes in. Humanity rebelled against God, their creator. God has every right to judge them and destroy them, and yet God in his great mercy still loves humanity. Not only does he love them, but he has planned that God the Son would come at one point, be born from the virgin, that that birth would mark the climax to God's grand story. So you have the rising tension, and you see it throughout all of human history. Up until the birth of Christ, you see the wickedness of man increasing. You see the cultures becoming more fallen, more broken, doing all kinds of evil for thousands of years, and then things change. God decided that at a moment in human history, his promise of a savior would come. That God the Son, God in the flesh, would take on human flesh through the Virgin Mary. That was prophesied in the Old Testament. It's reiterated in Matthew 1, 23, and it says this, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Here's the thing. God promised right when mankind fell, that he would send his own son to crush the head of the serpent and set free God's people once again to restore them to that state of union with him and perfection, to wipe away all their sins. He promised that. He ended up fulfilling it. And here's the thing. Think about how many movies and plot lines have stolen God's divine narrative. The promise of a savior being born. Here's one of them, Superman. Where did he come from? From the heavens to earth. Baby born. He ends up living and he's the same. He's he's human-ish, but not. He's better than humanity and he is the savior of the world, is he not? Totally plagiarized the Bible. What about Star Wars? I'm going there again. You're like, please stop talking about Star Wars. Sorry. It plays in. Okay, Luke Skywalker is not the promised savior. If you really look at the storyline, it, it, it really is Anakin. He was miraculously born. No father. His mother conceived by the force. Where did he get that idea? The Holy Spirit? The virgin birth? It's a total plagiarism of the story of God, of Christ's birth. And then he's supposed to bring balance to the force right? No, Jesus didn't come to bring balance to the force. He came to save humanity, to restore all of creation. They totally stole it. But here's the thing. We have in our very nature a storyline that we are programmed to find and love. And it's that a savior would come. The problem is, is people in their sinfulness don't want the true savior. They want a false one. We look for saviors in all other kinds of things and activities because we reject the one savior who has come for you and me. But the promise and the summary of Christmas itself, I heard this on the radio this morning. It was funny because I was going to listen to an audio book and I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me. Nope, listen to the radio. And I don't really like listening to the radio. Christian radio, I'm listening. And the Christian radio station had a quote from Pastor John MacArthur. And the quote was this, the entire Christmas story can be summarized in these three words, God with us. That is God's grand narrative is that God is with us. How? In the person of Jesus Christ. That is the message that the virgin would give birth, give birth to a son. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. Now, I just heard also today 
story of a, of a guy right now. He's a professional athlete. He's an NBA player, basketball player. And his name's Jonathan Isaac. And he's been under some criticism in our culture over the last couple of years because when all the professional athletes, many of them were taking a knee during the national anthem, he didn't. Could you ever imagine a time where a professional athlete would get criticized for standing during the national anthem? Kind of crazy, right? But he didn't go along with his team. They wore the BLM shirts. He chose not to, and he didn't take a knee. He stood because he said his Christian faith and he ended up making these statements. He said, the only true answer to the problems plaguing our society is the gospel of Jesus Christ or that good news or that true story. He said, it actually changes the hearts of men like it changed mine. And since then, he ended up turning down a, a shoe deal with Nike for his own basketball shoe. And he decided through the encouragement of his pastor to create his own shoe line. And these shoes that he came up with have a visible Bible verse on each um, release that they give. So he'll do a release, it's like 2 Corinthians 5, 17 or something, and, and it's a scripture verse. And then he's doing another one, and, and they keep releasing, and they're limited, and, and people are loving it. But here's the thing, the reason why he did this is he wants people to know and feel that God is with them. Do you know that God is with you? You see, you don't need to buy a pair of his shoes to know and feel that God is with you. You just need to believe the true story of Jesus, that God really came and was born for you and I. And here's the thing, we've heard it, we've gotten used to the message, but can we pretend for a moment that we've never heard the gospel? And somebody tells you, you know what? All of human history was building towards a day where God decided that he would send his own son to be miraculously born, that God the creator took on humanity. He became his own creation to save creation. He became man to save man. That should blow our minds. And so his life is the climax of all of human history. And then here comes the fourth and final part of a good story is the resolution. Ever watched a movie that has a horrible ending? Jen and I just watched one the other night. I'm not going to tell you the name because you'll be tempted to watch the movie. It was an post-apocalyptic, end-of-the-world type thing. It was the worst ending ever. Why? No resolution. You don't know what happened. You're left guessing. It's like they think it's an artistic like thing now where it's like, let's get people invested in a story and then just not give them any answers. It's horrible. Why don't you just play... 99% of the movie and then end it. That's basically how these stories are wrapping up. Thankfully, God's story has a beautiful resolution. See, there's a problem and it's our sin. We've been separated from God, every one of us. And yet God loved you and I so much that he sent Jesus. He was truly and really born of a virgin. He lived a perfect life. And then he decided through his own love for you and I. And here's the plot twist of all plot twists. He goes and dies on a Roman cross. That's the resolution nobody was expecting. Ever watch a movie and suddenly there's this plot twist and you're like, oh my gosh, and you want to tell everybody? You want to ruin it for them? Like, oh, did you see this movie? Hey, do you know what happens? Anybody like to ruin movies for other people? Something sinful about that. Don't be that person. But here's the thing. That part where he goes to the cross, here's what was so much of a plot twist in this true story, is instead of God coming in, in the Son and ruling as a king, he comes as a humble servant. Instead of conquering the enemy through a show of force, he surrenders himself to the power of the enemy and to death by dying on a cross. And it looks like he completely lost. He lost everything. He lost the battle for you and me. He lost the battle for life. He died. It's over. Satan has won. And yet appearing to have lost, he fulfilled the ancient prophecies of old and he rose from the dead three days later in victory. Story doesn't get better than that. But it doesn't end there, does it? The true story of Jesus includes you and I. We're part of that true story where you may have been lost in darkness and in sin. Living your life for yourself, apart from God, doomed to eternal separation from Him in hell. We've all lived a part of our life like that. 
And then God comes in to our life just as Jesus came into the world. And that's what's different about the true religion, Christianity. Every other religion is the story of how you and I, mankind, can come to God. How we can reach Him. Christianity says, we do not come to God, He comes and reaches us. He seeks out the lost. He comes seeking you and I and brings us to Himself. That's why the message of Christmas, the true story, if you were to boil it down in a summary, is God with us. And my hope for you and I this Christmas season is that you know that God is with you. That if you receive Jesus in faith and you live your life for him, God is with you. Now, you may not realize the significance of that right now. But I was just on a phone, uh, on a phone call with a lady from our church 15 minutes before the first service tonight. And we've been updated on what's going on with her adult age daughter. Now, this sweet lady has lost one adult age daughter already. And in the next 24 hours, it looks like she's going to lose her second. That they have to take her daughter off of all the meds that are keeping her alive. It's, there's, there's no way to help her. And she called, I, I called and talked to her the other day and she goes, Pastor, I just got off the phone with my daughter who just said her goodbyes to me. Now, after that, she got to go to the hospital and see her, and, and she was awake and coherent at the time. But can you imagine receiving that phone call from your child and knowing you will never speak to them again? Or being at their hospital bed and knowing that this is your last moments with them? If God does not exist, if Jesus isn't real, how can you go through that? How? But yet, she said to me on the phone, she goes, Pastor, I cannot explain to you the peace that Christ has given me through this. Her heart is literally being ripped out right now knowing that her daughter is going to die any moment. But she knows Christ. Her daughter has faith in Christ. And she knows that the story of Jesus is true. And because he truly raised from the dead, death has no power over the believer any longer. And she knows that though she may not see her daughter in this life, she will see her daughter in the next life for all of eternity. That she can have hope that God's promises are true, they're not fiction, and God's promises are real for you and me. That's what Christmas is about. That it is a real story that somebody did not manufacture, but God himself is telling this story. We're a part of this story, and we get to declare this truth through our life and rely upon the hope that what God has done through Christ, he's done for you and me, and we get to rest in that assurance the rest of our life until we get to go be with him. We have every reason in the world to celebrate the true story of Jesus and be reminded that he's with us. That's why every year we give you a little something when you come to our candlelight service. One year, it was a rope for hold fast, right? One year, it was a bell from Polar Express about not being a doubter, but a believer, right? And this year, it's just a reminder that that little token that has the cross emblazed on it is a reminder that that is the plot twist that we didn't expect, but the one that we needed. That God himself is with us because Jesus came to us, he died for us, and he rose again for us so you and I can have a new life in him. So don't forget the life that Christ has offered you and believe in him. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to go to our candle lighting part. And I'll explain that in a moment. But would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that the story you have told and are telling throughout human history is the true story. It's the story that matters most. It's the one written upon the human heart, a story in which God, you through Christ are our savior. You are the one that we need. You have set us free from sin and death and you are the one that we are to live for. Thank you for the restoration of all things in Christ. Thank you that eternal life is given only through faith in Jesus. And so we look to you now, Lord. We worship you in this time. We thank you for the gift of Jesus. And may we receive him by faith this Christmas season. 
And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go outside as a congregation, so we're gonna go through these two doors, and there's gonna be candles out there on the table, so please, everybody grab one. And if you can, don't stop at the tables, but keep walking in like a half circle and kind of surround in a half circle format as much as you can and, and squeeze in, and we're gonna go through a candle lighting part of the service, all right? So go ahead and make your way on out, and we'll meet you out there.